The integrity of those who signed the Declaration of Independence. This story is brought to you by David Barton, who is a historical expert on the lives of the signers. Enjoy. Right now, let me show you what I consider to be the, the best collective example of integrity that we have in American history. And it's really these guys right here, the signers of the Declaration. Because when you look at them signing the contract, and literally the Declaration of Independence was a contract, the first paragraph they start, they say, the laws of nature, nature's God, entitle us, enable us to become a free, independent nation. They then gave 27 reasons why, and they closed the Declaration with this. They said, now, for the support of this Declaration, and with a firm reliance on divine providence, we mutually pledged each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, and then they signed it. So they promised that for America to become free and independent, they'd give everything they had, life, fortune, reputation, sacred honor, they'd give it all. So if you want to see if they have integrity, pick any name off a list. You know, pick Roger Sherman or William Ellery or pick Lewis Morris or John Morton or, or, or pick George Wythe or Charles Carroll. Look at them and look at their life and say, aha, you came face to face with an opportunity to lose everything you owned. You came face to face with an opportunity to give your life. What would you do? Did you find a way to get out of it? Did you turn and run? That's how you find integrity. See if they kept their word. Now, to do that, you have to understand really what these guys were facing. I, I think the, the, the example I want to start with is this man right here, Robert Morse, because I think he had one of the most difficult jobs in the entire American Revolution. But you won't understand his job unless you understand the tone of what went on in the state. The day before these guys signed the Declaration of Independence, every single one of these guys had been a British citizen living in a British colony with a British-run government. They were all British citizens. They didn't have an army. They didn't have a navy. Great Britain was their army, their navy. Fifty-six British citizens got together and said, you know what? The 56 of us will pledge our personal resources to overthrow the world's greatest military power. Now, what do you think the chances... And that these were guys from all walks of life. I mean, there was a guy in here who who was just a simple farmer. And there was a guy who owned a huge estate, probably the largest farm in America. There was a guy in here who owned ships, and there was a guy in here who was just a sailor. There was a guy here who was a university president, and there was a guy who was just a simple teacher. I mean, every walk of life, some were rich, some weren't, some had a lot, some had nothing. All walks of life represented right here. Fifty-six guys say, we're going to give everything we possess individually to overthrow the world's greatest military power. What's the chances you think we get 56 people to make that commitment? lowered it and said, all right, let's make it the 18th greatest military power. You know, we're not giving 56 people to do that. Even if we dropped it all the way to the floor and said, okay, let's make it Haiti. Still ain't going to happen. You know, we're not giving 56 people to make a pledge like that. And these guys took on the world's greatest military power. Now, after having made that decision, they took Robert Morris down there and they named him the financier of the American Revolution. They said, Robert, run down to the bank and get us a loan on our new revolution. Now you tell me who in their right mind is going to invest anything into these 56. This is a high risk endeavor. Nobody's going to grant them any money because nobody really believes this can be done, including themselves. These guys, they made it very clear, Patrick Henry and others, that if God did not sovereignly intervene, this was not going to happen. That's why they said with a firm reliance on divine providence, if God doesn't pull this off, it ain't going to happen. I mean, it's just that simple. And so having said that, anybody on the outside, you're not going to invest your money in something like this and that's why we went for three years in the American Revolution before anybody started giving us loans. It was France and Holland started giving us loans after we won the Battle of Saratoga, three years in the Revolution, when we captured 5,000 crack British troops. They said, whoa, maybe this is not a bad risk after all. Maybe these guys will win this, so let's loan them some money. Where did we get the money for the first three years? His pocket. This guy personally gave $2 million in the cause of American independence. And think what $2 million is 200 years ago. That's a bunch of bucks. And just in case you think, well, you know, he had 30 million, he gave two, so what's the big deal? It wasn't like that. He gave all he had. How do we know that? Because Robert Morris, founding father, spent his latter days in debtor's prison. He didn't have anything left. He couldn't even keep his own house. He couldn't keep food on his table. He couldn't keep clothes on his own back because he gave it all so that we could be free and independent. And he sits there, he's lost his reputation, he's rotting in a debtor's prison because he kept his word. Now, interestingly, he never complained during that time. Why would you complain about keeping your word? I promised to do this. I did it. You can't complain about keeping my word. Same thing you see, the same kind of integrity you see with John Hart. John Hart was the Speaker of the House in New Jersey. He's signer of the Declaration from New Jersey. There are three things that were important in the life of John Hart. One was his relationship on, on God, quite literally. So he's an outspoken Christian. Two, the second thing important in his life is his family. Loves his wife 
great relationship with her, and they have 12 kids and a large family, so he loves his family. Third thing important to him was his farm. He had a great farm in New Jersey, and he loved farming, the, the rural life. Well, put him aside for a minute. On the British standpoint, if someone delivered, if you're the king of Great Britain, or if you're a leader in Great Britain, and somebody delivers to you a document signed by 56 people that pledge to overthrow your country, what are you going to do with that? That's an act of treason. What do you do with the traitors? You execute them. That's why when the British troops landed in America, the first order they had was to find those 56 and kill them. You execute them. If you can kill those leaders, we'll stop this movement right now. So British troops landed in Boston. Some went west. Some went south. Those that went south went into New Jersey. Who are they looking for? 56 who signed. John Hart, one of them. Well, they went into New Jersey, and one day John Hart was at home. He was taking care of his wife. She was sick in bed, and he was nursing her back to health. It was harvest time. The crops were coming in. Lots going on. Neighbors came busting through the front door. They said, John, John, the British troops quarter mile down the road. They're coming for you. They intend to hang you. They're going to kill you. you got to get out of here now. He said, but I can't. My wife's sick, and the crops are coming in. They said, look, we'll do what we can for all your stuff, but you promised us leadership. You're too important to lose. Leave now. They shoved him out the back door, and he fled in the woods. British troops were coming up the front path as he fled in the woods. They came inside, searched the house, couldn't find him, figured he must have fled in the woods. So they sent British troops out in the woods to look for him. For the next one year, British troops pursued him through the woods of New Jersey. He was able to elude them for one year. That's four seasons of the year. And in that period of time, John Hart never spent two nights in a row in the same place. He would crawl up in the boughs of trees and sleep. He'd bury himself with leaves, hide under rotted logs. For one full year, he eluded those troops all over the woods of New Jersey. Well, finally, Great Britain has to go in other places. They take the troops out. They leave New Jersey. He decides it's safe to come home. So he heads home. First thing he sees when he gets home is he doesn't have a home. It's been burned flat to the ground. All of his crops are on the ground. All of his barns are on the ground, been burned. He doesn't even have a tool shed standing. But now panic sits in. My wife, my kids, where are they? He searches and finds that his wife, who had been sick when he left, had died of that sickness, and he hadn't been there. And that just tore his heart out. But now he's got the responsibility of the 12 kids. Got to look out for the kids. Searched for the kids and found out, found out that the British had taken his 12 kids and scattered them to the four winds. He searched and searched and never again found his kids. The guy died literally weeks later of a broken heart. Everything in this world that was important to him, he had lost. But in that period of time, he never complained. Why would you complain over keeping your word? Then you have individuals with the same kind of integrity, like Stephen Hopkins. Stephen Hopkins is the governor of Rhode Island, very popular governor. He's a strong Christian. He's a Quaker. You can tell that by his hat. As a matter of fact, you can find Stephen Hopkins in any founding picture. I mean, guess which one is Stephen Hopkins? This is not a hard one. Now, Stephen Hopkins, of all the 13 governors, he had the reputation of having the most elegant handwriting of any governor. So when you look at the signatures on the Declaration and look for the signature of Stephen Hopkins, you think you're looking for a great signature, and then you stumble on it right here, Stephen Hopkins. You go, whoa, that's not real neat. And then see a big picture over here, there? That has got to be the ugliest signature on the Declaration of Independence. And he's supposed to have the best handwriting? What's the story with this? Well, when he was called to sign the Declaration, called to the table, put his signature down, he was approaching his 70th birthday. That's not real impressive because the average lifespan in America today is 78.9, 79 roughly. 70 was impressive back then. Do you know what the average lifespan was in America in the 1770s? It was 35 years old. This guy was approaching his 70th birthday. That's impressive. Before he was called to sign the Declaration, shortly before, he'd suffered a paralyzing stroke on the right side of his body. So when they called him to sign the... And he was right-handed. They called him to sign the Declaration. He went up there dragging that dead right foot and dragging that dead right arm. He got to the table. He took his left arm and flipped that dead one up on top of the Declaration. Took the, the good left hand, dipped the quill in the ink, slipped between the fingers, squeezed those dead fingers around it. And with his left hand, he grabbed that right hand and made it sign his name on the Declaration. That's why it looks so bad. Now, anybody else would have said, whoops, medical disability, I've had a stroke, I can't be there. Not this guy. He pledged his life, and there's no way you're going to get him to break his word. He's only lost half the life. The right side's dead, he's still got a left side that works great. I mean, there's just, that's in their mind. You cannot get them to break their word. The integrity is right down their backbone. They cannot break their integrity. And that was made clear in the only conversation that happened on the day they signed the Declaration. Only one conversation that happened with this man right here is Benjamin Harrison. Now, Benjamin Harrison is a signer from Virginia. And if you look at that picture, that's a fairly broad face. And man, look at that neck and those shoulders. This is a big guy. And he was powerful. Records would indicate that he's probably the most, he's the strongest of all the founding fathers. He could pick up a keg or a barrel and move it when it'd take several other guys to move it. On the other end of the physical spectrum was Elbridge Jerry of Massachusetts. And you look at that picture, see how thin that face is and frail, looks fragile. 
bless his heart, he was almost five feet high, weighed almost 100 pounds. Tiny little guy. Founding fathers used to kid him about how small he was. They say, Elbridge, good thing you're born in Massachusetts because you don't get strong winds up there. If a strong wind ever came through and blow you away, we'd never find you again. Who knows where you'd end? I mean, he was tiny, and, and, and they kidded with him about that size. And both of these guys you can see right here. This gentleman down in the front left, right here, this big guy right there, that is Benjamin Harrison. He's the big guy. The guy leaning on his arm right there is Elbridge Jerry. He's the little guy. And you can see the size difference right there between the two. Well, what happened was the day they signed the declaration, Charles Thompson right here, the secretary, called them to the table one at a time. And it was deathly silent because they all knew that by signing this, they were exposing themselves to execution. I mean, they are going to be labeled as traitors in Great Britain's eyes. And if they don't win this war, every one of them is going to be killed. And the chances of winning the war are slim to none, unless God sovereignly intervenes one at a time, and Charles Thompson would say, for example, he'd say, George Reed, Delaware. George would get up, he'd go over to the table, and you'd hear him scratch his name on the parchment. He'd go sit down. Then you'd hear Samuel Huntington, Connecticut. Sam would get up, and he'd walk over, and you'd hear him scratch. Well, they finally worked their way around to Elbridge Jerry. And Elbridge right here, they said, Elbridge Jerry, Massachusetts. And he came forward, he dipped the ink, he was just about to write his name when the big guy had something to say. Right here, Benjamin Harrison had a comment to make. Now, this conversation was recorded by Dr. Benjamin Rush in his diary. And after the revolution, he wrote back to John Adams. He said, John, he said, do you remember what happened the morning we signed that? He said, do you recollect the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the House when we were called up one after another to the president, to the table of the president of Congress to subscribe to what was believed by many at that time to be our own death warrants? Remember how quiet it was that day? He said, the silence and gloom of the morning were interrupted, I well recollect, only for a moment by Colonel Harrison of Virginia, the big guy, who said to Mr. Jerry at the table, the little guy, and you can see it in your mind's eye, the guy's just about to sign his name, and here comes the comment. He says, I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Jerry, when we're all hung for what we're now doing. He says, from the size and great weight of my body, I'll die in a few minutes. From the lightness of your, you then in the air an hour or two before you're dead. <laughs> the only comment made all day is, you don't even weigh enough to hang. If they hang you, you won't even die. These guys knew what it was to keep their word. And this was not political rhetoric. And that's why when you look at these 56 who pledged their lives, fortune, sacred honor, you find that nine of these guys who wanted us to be free and independent never lived to see that. Five of them were tortured before they died. Twelve of them lost every single thing they owned. Three of them lost their kids. Matter of fact, this man right here, his name is Abraham Clark. Abraham Clark, his two sons were captured by the British and put in separate British prisoner of war camps where they were tortured. And in the American Revolution, if you ended up in a British prisoner of war camp, that was essentially an execution sentence. We lost 10,000 more Americans in British prisoner of war camps than we did the British bullets. As an American soldier, you're much safer being on the battlefield with bullets flying around you than you are being captured and put in a British prisoner of war camp. Well, they caught his two sons. They had him in two prisoner of war camps. They were torturing them, and they went to Abraham. They said, Abraham, as you know, we have your two sons in these camps. If you will renounce your signature on the Declaration of Independence, if you'll admit that what you did was wrong, we'll turn your two sons loose. Abraham said, that'd be a lie. I can't do it. I believed it was right when I did it. I still believe it's right now. If I renounce it, that'd be a lie, and I can't do that. Ooh, what a sacrifice. But that's keeping your word. Seems to me like that's what the...